So there's this um, thing on Facebook that's like, I guess it's a page on Facebook that does videos. Uh-huh. It's called ju- ju- What's it called? I'm streaming, Jubilee? by the way. Huh? I'm oh. streaming, by the way. So it's called Jubilee. Mm-hmm. And it's super interesting because they do these uh, like social experiments. I know Jubilee. Wait. Yeah, so they take like two, they take people from two completely opposites of uh, some spectrum. Recording right? in progress. Right. Uh, and it could be like one they did recently was Palestinians and Israelis, mm-hmm. right? And all about the Palestinian Israeli conflict and asked questions about their views. And if they agree, they come up to the front and explain why they agree. If they disagree, they stay in the back. And then like after, I don't know, some couple of minutes, they come to the front and explain their view. Right. And they do this like for any spectrum of conversation. Uh, I don't know, there was one about like bodybuilders or whatever. Um, there's one I really want to watch about like wearing makeup versus not wearing makeup. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, uh, I feel very strongly about that because I don't, I mean, I grew up like not really, my mom never wore makeup ever, ever. Not like no blush, no foundation, no mascara, nothing, never ever and so when i got interested in makeup she was like oh hell no you're not wearing makeup you right. know i'm gonna make sure you like never wear makeup and so now the most i'll do is like some blush maybe some mascara but like i never do the foundation or the contouring crap whatever because i think that you know our beauty is natural and we should show what we have naturally and the amount of makeup and the, uh, what's it called? The, how like evolved makeup has become is to a point where you could put on some makeup and like no one would realize what kind of face is beneath what you're wearing. Yes. Like nobody would know. Do you know where that came from? Because it's. Do you know where that came from? No. Drag queens. Did it come from drag queens? I, I feel like it came from just like the makeup industry and trying to sell us makeup. Drag queens. Because yeah. I, I can't speak for the whole, okay. Let's do the intro first. <laughs> then we'll get into that. Yeah, completely off topic. Here. Completely off topic, but it's okay. You know, good conversation is a good conversation. It's the Booze and BJJ podcast. I cannot drink tonight <laughs> because I self-sabotaged. And I'm having a bit of a gout flare up in my foot. Drinking more would be bad. But anyways, I had a good day, a good week of training. Um, started teaching my Friday night no gi class again with the blessing of Masugi. And oh, I rolled with him uh, yesterday. I got like ten minutes with him. Oh wow, nice. That was a lot of fun. I, I yeah. keep forgetting how fun it is to roll with him. Even. Fun. I think it's I fun. I always use that adjective. When I roll with him. We, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just me and him. Like, we just, we, okay, this is going to sound awful. We giggle, like, most of the time. Because we're just, like, we're countering each other constantly. And it's just, it's good fun. Um, Mm -hmm. My beard got caught in one of his collar choke attempts. And I tapped. (laughs) You're like, ah. I was like, nope. (laughs) Tappity tap. Um, Because that that becomes more of, like, a neck crank. It becomes a beard crank. It hurt. Yeah. <laughs> like, it just, like, pulling hair. Mm, true. Yeah. So, anyways, how was your week of training, Yana? Uh, well, I trained twice. So, you know, I, that's pretty much my standard these days is, is twice a week, unfortunately. Uh, but it was good. It was Tuesday and then Saturday at noon. I went mm-hmm. to high noon mm-hmm. and Tim and 
uh, Mia weren't there. So um, things were a little calmer, a little bit more chill. So they're, they're the uh, owners of the gym and they're cool. But you know how it is when the owners are there. It's a little stressful. Everybody's all hyped up. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's better. Um, it's always a little bit more chill when the owners aren't there. So um, and I was also coming from D.C., I went to the zoo with my little one and her dad and uh and i was like i'm not i didn't feel like driving all the way to chantilly so i was just like let me get just go to alexandria where i live yeah. um anyway so no the the training was good um but i'm always disappointed in in like how few days a week i can train um and, but I am trying to make up for that by going to the gym, you know, weightlifting, a little bit more cardio, maybe even if it's only like 30 minutes, you mm -hmm. know, cause I need to get like the fitness back up. Cause that will always impact the, the jujitsu performance. Yes. So, um, but otherwise, yeah, I am drinking wine tonight. I'm being classy mm -hmm. and and I'm also snacking. So I hope. Our viewers, viewers don't mind about that. That's fine. I snack sometimes. So on the note of conditioning, uh, our good friend Wilson has been getting ready for a Muay Thai fight, and he's been coming and rolling with us on Fridays. The difference between before his uh, fight conditioning started and after is amazing. Like, beforehand, I could... It makes a difference. Yeah, I could butterfly Huge. sweep him. I could... There's a lot of stuff I could do just repeatedly to him that I could, had difficulty with this this past Friday. Like mm -hmm. it, it was it was like fighting a completely different dude. But super proud of him. Look forward to him getting his first uh, amateur fight. See what seeing seeing what happens with that. But um, yeah, conditioning makes like listen. If you're thinking about competing, <laughs> conditioning makes a huge difference. Um, I know when I was competing a lot, I was conditioning uh, like many days a week on top of my jujitsu training. So I was in the gym like six, seven days a week, you know, um, just, you know, getting back into the rhythm, rhythm of things. So it's different now, but uh, it makes a huge difference. Like just, you know, not gassing out as soon mm -hmm. as you would have otherwise. Yeah, because I remember seeing you... Like, I would sneak off to the gym, the old gym we used to train at. And mm -hmm. no matter, it seemed like no matter when I showed up, I always saw you there. I was like, man, like, what is yeah, she doing? Yeah, I was there like, I had no life. I had no life. Yeah. I the gym was my life. So, yeah. I'm not saying that like I'm proud, but it definitely it was a big part of my identity that I struggle with now that I don't have. You know, it's like when life changes occur and they force you to kind of step into the shoes of a different role. It's hard to disconnect from the identity that you've kind of created for yourself. And that's where I'm at now, where I identified very heavily as like someone who, like a gym rat. I was in the gym all the time training all the time, doing jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, whatever. And now that I'm a mom, I'm a single full-time working mom, it's like totally different. And mm -hmm. now my priority is like being a mom, like first and foremost, being the best mom I can be and like everything else kind of falls to the wayside. And, but it's, it's not that, I'm not saying that I'm mad or upset about that. It's just um, a challenge sometimes to like, remind yourself life happens mm -hmm. and you have to be forced to like, you know, unlearn certain things or transition out of one identity into another and be okay with that, you know? Yeah. Cause I mean like, you know, human beings, we all, we always want to like identify as a certain thing, you know, or a certain person, whatever. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I mean, the funny thing is, um, 
when I first started out, especially when we first met, I uh, I identified as a uh, as a jelly donut. Like I I <laughs> I was so round. Yeah. You know, I was like, how do I stop being a jelly donut? And that was kind of partially my motivation of not being um, out of shape and obese anymore. I so. mean, the, like how far you've come is like insane. It's insane. And how do I identify now? Um, a bear. As a beard? <laughs> like a pirate? No. Um <laughs> I don't know, actually. That was something I was thinking about. Because I think I'm just identifying as me, whatever me is. You know what I mean? Yeah, and our, our, our identity is like so many things. It's not just like one thing, obviously. But like there is usually like one or two things that our identity most strongly ties to, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to project here, but I think for you, like, First and foremost, you're a dad. Like you, you have three kids now. With the like the the one most recently within the past month. Mm -hmm. So you're first and foremost a dad, and you're an awesome freaking dad. And then I would say second, you're a teacher. Mm -hmm. You you teach firearm uh, marksmanship. Mm -hmm. You teach jujitsu. Mm -hmm. You teach life lessons to your friends. I, I don't do say, that intentionally. <laughs> nah, that's just that's just who you are. You're a teacher. That's what I'm saying. That's your yeah. identity. No, nah, I, I mean, I, I was thinking, I was actually talking to one of my coworkers about that, and um, it seems like I, uh, I hate to say this, I've kind of fallen into an area where I'm kind of like um, people's. Like a, a, an uncle to a lot of people. Like, You're what? Like an uncle. Like I've uncle. I've become okay. like an uncle to a lot of people, and mm -hmm. it, it's weirding me out. Because you know, I think, oh, this guy's just my friend. Yeah, cool. And then he calls me like Tio, and I'm like, excuse me, I'm like Tio. Mm -hmm. My name's Thomas. Don't. I know what it means, but I'm like, don't, don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sh sh stop. It's like I want to. Just let me have this one, okay? No, but you know, there's, there's all I've. I've noticed that there's a lot of people who need, like, uh, direction, direction. Guidance. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I just yeah, that's where I've fallen, you know. And it's interesting. Yeah, no, me. and I think you do a great job of that too, because you always make the person feel like you're not trying to criticize them. You're just trying to offer some advice. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. But so today's topic. I, I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, I'll let you introduce it. So it was a Facebook fa Facebook, Facebook post by John Danaher himself. And it does state, Most athletes aspire to believe they will win before going into a match. The best athletes don't believe they'll win. They know they're going to win. But what happens when you have two athletes who both know they're going to win prior to a match? Well, that's when shit gets interesting. Profound. Mm. Your thoughts, madam? Uh, well, I'll start with personal experience. I'm not going to... Okay, there's a three-parter there, right? It's like um, believing that you will win. That's the first part. Second part is knowing you will win, right? What's the difference between the two? And then the third part is what happens when both know they're going to win. And so I'll just start. I'm just going to address the first two parts. I mean, I, know, I feel like everybody knows the third part. That's called the Olympics, right? And or I guess Jiu-Jitsu just got into the Olympics, thankfully. It did? But um, yeah. Oh, wait, no, that was a fucking... <laughs> Yeah, oh, man, I just remembered. Yeah, that was actually fake. Sorry, guys. Sorry, all the viewers out there. Um, psych, it didn't get into the Olympics, but it should be in the Olympics. Um, but, I mean, it applies to any sport, right? Like judo. Let's think about judo. Two uh, judokas who know they're going to win 
you know, obviously it gets interesting because they put a hundred percent into it and you end up seeing, you know, masters at work, right. Against each other. So I don't think there is much we can say personally about that, but I think both of us can say a lot about the difference between thinking you're going to win and knowing you're going to win and what that results in and what that can risk, right? What risk Mm -hmm. that comes with. So I'll say for personal experience, like I, when I first started competing, I was winning gold, like all the time, every time I competed and whenever I'm, I, I won't, I'm kind of an insecure person. So I always think like, holy shit, that other person is going to be so much better than me. Like I have to, I'm like one of those people who's like insecure. So they over prepare, over prepare. Okay. And in this case, I'm not over preparing. I'm like preparing exactly as I need to, to win gold. But, um, when I was competing, when I was just starting out, it was more like, I don't know. I have to always assume that uh, that other person, uh, my opponent is going to, they're going to win gold. And if I want to win gold, if I want to get my money's worth out of the competition, if I want to make my sensei proud, I have to train and like for my pride, you Mm -hmm. know, first and foremost for my pride. Right. Um, I have to like overtrain. I have to think like a month out, I have to win every single match I'm going against. So when I think about that quote saying, um, you think you're going to win or you know you're going to win, I'm always thinking about, or like I reflect on those days where I was competing against not competing against, but like training against my training partners. And when I would do that up to a competition, I would be thinking like, I need to win each match. Mm -hmm. I need to, like, I can't afford to not win. I can't afford to not submit. Like I have to try to submit, I have to try to win no matter what belt level they are, whatever. Each, like any training partner, any match um like a month out Mm -hmm. and it's like i think that's what really makes the difference it's like when you when you know you're gonna compete you think you're gonna compete it always you have to like back plan a month away and start training like you're gonna win there's this like philosophy in the army right where it says train as you fight Mm -hmm. and that's the mentality that I always put to training when I was competing a lot is that I was training like I was in those matches that I was mentally preparing for Mm -hmm. because I I always assumed that that other person is doing the same exact thing, that they're submitting all of their training partners, not being a dick about it, but like, you know, Training all their well, I probably was an asshole back then, but I've been told that I was. I'm, I'm a different person now. But um, like, and that's probably why. What? Nothing. I'm not. No, anything. okay. He he he's agreeing to that. That's that's what that is. Um, no, I mean like I was just when I, I was training with Danny at high noon. On Saturday, and he kind of alluded to that also. Like, I used to be an asshole. And I'm like, damn, I really was. Being a mom has like really changed my personality. I feel like you know, taking that time off and like, yeah, yeah, right. Um, and just kind of hormones. You know how? Well, maybe not all of our audience, but some of our audience might know what that feels like for the hormones to like impact your personality. But um, but yeah, I was kind of an asshole, and I was an asshole, I guess, because. Every t- I was competing a lot, and like a month out before each competition, I was like, "I need to win, always." You you every went, time you went pretty hard, but yeah. you also got results. 
So exactly, yo, I was winning gold all the time. I went to I uh, IBGJF Worlds. I got silver, and then another time I got bronze. But we won't talk about that. Um, but like all the you know local competitions, I was like boom, 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 boom. You know, I was doing I was doing really well, and Sugi was like. I think he he was singing like I was kind of a prodigy there for a little bit, um, but you know, I think about those days. I'm like, oh, now look at me, <sighs> training two days a week. What is this? Well, you could still do a lot with two to three days a week. You have to maximize it. I mean, look at Sugi. Yeah, yeah. You know, you just you just have to maximize it, but. Mm -hmm. You know, com but that, that's my take. Yeah. Um, also, like knowing that you're going to win has to be focused. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go into training with that kind of mentality. You know, this training is training. You're not going to you go there to learn. You're not going to go. In my opinion, you don't go there to try to beat anybody or win. You know, especially if, for example, like me. I'm in my 40s. I train two to three times a week. Sometimes I'll sneak off and do a double double class on a day or two. But I can't go hard. If I go hard, I'm going to be hurt, injured, you know, sore. I can't, can't train the next day or you know, the next day after that. I'll have to take time off. So I don't go into training with the mentality of I'm going to win. I go in the training with a mentality, I'm going to go have fun. Does that work for training for a competition? Not necessarily. It's probably not the best, but it can be done. But when it's competition time, you have to go in there with the mentality that you're going to win. Other, uh, that you know that you're going to win, like Diner said. Otherwise, you know, that, that could lead to self-doubt. You know, mm -hmm. that could lead to all sorts of negative thoughts that could mean... That could, uh, you know, mean the difference between a submission or, you know, hesitation that could cause a reversal or something on you. Yeah, there's that phrase that, like, preparation breeds confidence. Yes. Right? So, like, that's kind of the mentality I was, I always brought with me. Mm -hmm. The training is that the more I prepare, the more I do, the more I train, the more confident I will be. Right? And when it's competition and there's like, I, I feel like this is more, this phrase is more in Muay Thai or I learned it in Muay Thai rather than Jiu Jitsu that uh, you want to train harder. You want to, how is it? Like you want to train so hard that like when the fight comes, it's easy. Right. That was like, that was my mentality. But you brought up a really good point in that um, now that we're older, we're higher belts, we're, we're parents, you know, we have other priorities in life, which is totally okay. And that's just like life, you know, but we're, I think we're also kind of, I hate using the word privileged because that that's a loaded word, but, um, we are at a stage in our jujitsu career where we're, purple belts and we can kind of afford to do that right mm -hmm. where we can kind of like get a little comfortable settle in a little bit and coast and it's totally okay for us to do that because you know we have different priorities mm -hmm. we're parents we don't want to get injured we have careers blah 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 you know um but I can see how, you know, a white belt or a blue belt, like who I was, who you were, mm -hmm. we were thinking, you know, we need to try to get up to that level. We need to at least make it to purple belt to like establish ourselves. And mm -hmm. in order to do that, we need to train really hard, go 100% all the time. But, and this is a great segue into the next um, kind of, conversation I wanted to have, which is the risks of doing that, right? There mm -hmm. are risks in doing that. It's like a double-edged sword where it's understandable that you as a beginner 
and you know, I was there too, where I'm like training hard, going out a hundred or at least 80% all the time. And as has been already explained or mentioned here, I was an asshole. Like not everybody wanted to train with me because I was going so hard all the time. And there were only like certain training partners who were like reluctant, but okay with training with me. And I say that to kind of illustrate how there are risks associated with training that hard all the time because other people in the class might see that as a sign of disrespect mm -hmm. or as a sign that like callousness that you don't care mm -hmm. and where I am now I can totally understand that more than where I was more than uh more than I could when I was you know a blue belt trying aspiring to be a purple belt and the way I understand it now is like when as a purple belt training with white belts who are in that like mindset that they have to go 90 or hundred or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to train with them. Like I avoid them cause I can see it from a mile away. And I'm like, that is an injury waiting to happen. And I don't want that. Right. And so like, that's why I say it's a double-edged sword because when you're in competition mode and you're trying to get better and you're trying to have that, like, I'm going to win mentality. You're going at 90, you're going at a hundred, but you don't have enough technique to know that some of the things that you're doing are going to cause injury or like very risky. Mm -hmm. And when you're a uh, more seasoned uh, jujitsu practitioner, purple belt, you're like, they're fucking spastic. You know, they're muscling through things. They're being spastic. They're going to cause an injury and that shit happens all the time, you know, and I don't know. It's like I get both sides because I was in I was there. I was like on that white blue belt side where I was going hard all the time. And uh, while I, he just joined us and he could definitely speak to that where I was an asshole when I was a, a white belt and a blue belt. He hasn't rolled with me much when. I was a purple belt, but, um, but he can definitely speak to like the fact that I was like, boom, 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 boom. I, I mean, you went hard. I went hard all the time. <laughs> all the time. Right? Yeah. I, and, and I'm, I'm saying now that like looking back, I could see how like there were a lot of people who didn't, who like avoided trying to roll with me because of that. Right. And as a purple belt now, I, I avoid I avoid those same people. I avoid me, you know? So I don't know. It's like a double-edged sword because you need to have that mentality. Like I'm going to win. But when you have that mentality and you don't know enough technique, like it's, it's a dangerous combo. Like, um, yeah, exactly. There, there, I've actually argued in class in front of master Sugi with one guy, because for months I was telling him he needed to calm down. And I told him specifically why. It's like, you're going to hurt people. And then every, at least once or twice a week, this young gentleman, and I know he's better about it now, definitely hurt people. Then he got partnered with a number of uh, prospective students, you know, on their tryout. And it's like, hurt him, hurt him again, hurt another one. It's like, dude, just tone it down. Like, you need to learn how to do these moves correctly. And then later on, you can apply speed strength or whatever but what's really dangerous and this happened this week is one of our training partners got really injured mm -hmm. because uh a young man that mentality has that mentality you know i need mm -hmm. to go 100 percent to win slash learn how to get my technique better um tried a specific throw did it incorrectly used a lot of force because he, he's not at a stage where he knows enough technique, right? Correct. It's like we can't necessarily blame him for that, per se. 
because it's like he's a he's a white belt, you know. Mm-hmm. He's not going to know uh, yeah. proper technique. I mean, I, I I think that you know, as a white belt or as someone coming in, you only do the technique that's being taught to you. You know, you don't bring that YouTube bullshit into you know into class. Even if you are using YouTube, you know, you don't you don't use that in class. Whatever is being taught in class is what you should stick to until until you get more experience and then you get to a higher belt and you understand you know the mechanics of different moves and you understand you know the potential dangers of different moves. So yeah, yeah. I yeah, I, I, I think totally it's agree with that. Kinda, yeah, and like you're saying, you can't fault them if they're doing the technique wrong, but if they're, they're doing something that's not even on the curriculum, then that's, you know, that's a whole mm-hmm. other story. Mm-hmm. Wait, was he doing something that we had already taught and he just wasn't doing it right? It sounded like he tried to drop Tsunagi, but he mm. did it at a wrong, at the wrong angle. And, and then... it's like that, I don't know, man. So when I, I heard the story, it was that he was getting more aggr- increasingly aggressive, and then his training partner, the one he injured, was feeding into that, right? Because yeah. he was a he's a white belt, she's a blue belt, right? So you know they're both in that in like maybe two stripe <clears throat> blue belt, you know. So not that like not that close to purple belt, but. Still, like, very competitive, very good at the level, right? But, neat, like, all that being said, still not, like, seasoned enough, neither of them seasoned enough to know when to de-escalate things. You know what I mean? Like, I feel yeah, like I mean, when I, you're seasoned, yeah. you understand, like, oh, this person's going hard. I need to yeah. de-escalate. I need to tell them, chill out. But because of both their levels, you know, the white belt was going really hard. The blue belt was like, oh, I got to, like, one-up this person, right? Well, I, I think it's, and then they I, start I, going hard, and then it's mm-hmm. like, boom, that's it. Disaster happens. I think it's personality, really, because, it's mm-hmm. you know, you, you have people who are, who are white belts who are just fine, and, you know, they don't, you know, they're not. You know, they're not going hard and they're sticking to, to the program. So I, I think at the end of the day, it's personality. And if somebody who is like a white belt or is just starting out and they go, you know, all out, you, you never know who you get paired with. The person that you get paired with, you know, they they could be a white, a white belt, purple belt, blue belt, whatever belt. And they see that you're going hard. So they're like, okay, you know, this person wants to go hard. So let me ratchet it up. So... I, yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's just it comes down to personality. Yeah. You know, if yeah, that's if I, true. Yeah, like if I was in that situation, like for me, you know, because I'm old and I don't want to break anything, I'm not going to continue with that person. Or I'll be like, hey, you know, can you bring it down? And if they don't, then I'm I'm not. I, I have no problems with saying no to rolling with someone. Also, I think an, an issue is with this particular young man that Yano was referencing, and I think a lot of others, they see the higher belts, the rolling, and it, their technique is a lot smoother and maybe a little bit more efficient, a little bit quicker than um, you know everyone else. And then they assume that they're going hard, going 100%. And um, because of their lack of knowledge of jiu-jitsu they assume that going 100 percent is what they're supposed to do as well even though it's, it's a misconception of what they're viewing you know um a lot of the younger guys and a lot of the newer guys that i roll with always think i'm going 100 percent, but i barely ever am barely ever and that's such a great point yeah and i've definitely i've felt that like personally as a purple belt rolling with black belts and i'm thinking like damn, like, they're going, they're being hella aggressive, they're going hard, whatever. And then I realized, like, in hindsight, they weren't even really breathing hard at all, right? It's all, like, that was all mess, muscle memory, man. That was all muscle memory. That was just 
you know, experience. And I just interpret it as aggression because I expect myself to be good and they're crushing me. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you. I feel like you experience that at all stages, mm -hmm. whether you're a white belt or a blue belt, purple belt, whatever, you know? Yeah. And that the day that this particular incident that we're referencing happened, I partnered with uh, another guy who was very similar to the culprit, and he was going crazy on me too. And I, I was just standing there. I just held his collar, stiff-armed him, and just let him work it out. I literally just held my arm out on his collar, high lapel, and let him just, you know aggressively try to get my single leg double leg on me as, as much as he wanted and and he would try like judo like judo throws and i would just palm his hip push him away and just keep letting him go and in but, hindsight oh, sorry oh, i have a cat here kitty cat but i probably pissed him off even more in hindsight it did so i actually started um doing takedowns and throws on him periodically to to try to temper that but you know again it comes down to personality you know, some people right. will see what I'm doing and understand, oh, he's just trying to, you know, keep an aggressive person from coming at him. And other yeah. people are going to see me just being an asshole. Yeah. So, in that case, maybe a little bit of both. But Life is perspective. Yeah. Definitely. So. Wally, <sighs> so you just joined us. Yeah. Why can't we see you? Um, because I'm lying down in bed. Hold on. <laughs> Let me move to a more appropriate setting. Dude, you better not so be in pajamas. See. I don't want to see. I don't want to see Wally pajamas. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe. Maybe. maybe I'm okay that I with should. pajamas as long as it's not your. Uh, what do they call it? Your. Uh... <sighs> Birthday suit. Birthday suit, that's what it is. I kept oh. thinking bathing suit. I'm like, Well, you know, let me change out of my lingerie then. So. <laughs> <laughs> my silk lingerie. I'm wearing silk rash guards right now. Oh, snap. Okay. No, I'm not. I was going to say, you're like treating yourself. Nope. But anyway, so the the... The well, hey, it's oh, been a while. Hey, hey, hey dude, yeah. we're, we're matching. We're matching. I got gray in my beardy beard beard, too. Oh, yeah, I got gray, like, all over me. Um, At least you have hair. But, um, but, <laughs> but yeah, ultimately, like, going, uh, not really having a lot of accumulated skill and then going hard during practice, you know, thinking that you need to win can ultimately end up in, in some serious injuries. You know, yeah. tr trying a takedown um, it, it, of any sort, whether it be wrestling based or judo based, you know, you could you could come in at a wrong angle. You could you can do an entry at a wrong angle and then try to force it, and that could cause pressure mm -hmm. on all sorts of different things, mm -hmm. including the one's <clears throat> knees. And it can cause like tendon ruptures, tendons to snap, or if yeah. you force it with enough brute force, you can slam somebody on the mat like way harder than it than, yeah. than it's necessary i mean like for example today i was doing judo right and you know i've been doing judo for a while i'm a green belt now and so i know something about judo and i was doing randori with a black belt and you know he went for uchimata and he i i didn't even know that i did this but i had wrapped my leg kind of great find my leg around the leg that he was using to sweep me and he stopped me right there and he was like oh you know don't do that because then it's hard for him to get his leg out if he needs to like regain his balance and mm -hmm. you know i could end up falling on him and you know you know could end up like messing up joints and stuff like that mm -hmm. and you know luckily I was able to stop in the middle when he told me to stop, but that was just, that's an example of something. It's like, even with experience, you know, you, you may not necessarily 
know where your body is relative to other people and so you can still even with experience um cause injury so now yeah now you know having someone who has no experience trying these moves and they have no idea what they're doing then that that's definitely a super dangerous thing Mm -hmm. so then like going back to that quote how do you reconcile that like the winners are those who know they're going to win versus those who think they're going to win like how do you reconcile that like the, the the verbiage there first of all and then second of all that belief when you're training especially if you're newer into the into the sport so the one thing i was thinking about was to re- reiterating over and over again you know at the beginning of class right before rolling starts and even at the end of class like just hammer it in training is not a competition you're not trying to beat no. your training partner you know it's for learning know. you know yeah. uh, i can't tell you how many times i've wanted to practice a specific move and i just spam it over and over again and then people pass my guard people get submission attempts on me i don't care i just want to figure yeah. you know how to do an omoplata from lasso guard out but at the same time when it comes to competition we need to reiterate to everybody you know that's when you need to truly digest mentally that you're going to you know that you're going to win your matches you know in the more yeah, I mean go ahead i think i think some people come in thinking that you know they're just going to they're just going to come in and know what to do you know they're like oh i got this i just know what to do i know i know my body knows how to do this like i've been doing right. some sort of sort of other athletic sport so i'm i'm gonna come in and i'm gonna so i'm good to do i'm good yeah it's like i know I've, I've watched these videos blah 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 but like you were saying you know it's you it comes down to training like you know training that one specific thing over and over and over again so if you just come in with the mentality that i know what i'm doing you're gonna miss that opportunity to really that's so that true skill mm-hmm. yeah and then when it comes to you've competition closed your time, mind yeah, and then when it comes to competition time, you're not going to know what to do. You know? Yeah. Mm. Another thing I wanted to point out, like when I was a lower belt, um, I feel like there are a lot of lower belts who, for whatever reason, do not listen to their coach. And to me, it's like, why aren't you listening to your coach, right? Um. You mean I like doing training or just like, like training anything. or hmm. just like like I <laughs> mean like, I've why seen are you this there, then? <laughs> I, okay so like I've seen this wild training where a simple example is that I was ro- rolling with someone and we were bumping into two people who were lower belts mm-hmm. and our coach was like literally saying to them move and it's like they just didn't freaking hear him and i'm just like if if they can't have enough awareness that they can't even hear him how would they be able to hear him trying to coach when they're competing and there are a lot of people at their lower belts i guess not even just lower belts uh, whoever who when they're competing they're not listening to their coach and i don't know if that's a pride thing or if it's like an attention span thing, I really don't know. I think it could be one or one or the either or both. I, I really don't know. Yeah. But um, I think that plays a huge role in how well you move forward with the sport yeah. is yeah. how well you can listen to your sensei. That's a huge yeah. component of it. And you have to be, you have to allow your ego to like take a fucking back, take a back seat, seat. Yeah. yeah and like listen to your coach because they know and that's what i've always like when i started my jiu-jitsu career that's what i always did with sugi is like he freaking competed in the olympics he knows his shit he became a black belt in like six eight years like he freaking knows what he's doing and that's what i always had in my mind 
every time he was teaching, every time he was trying to coach me, like he knows what he's saying. He knows what to do. So I need to listen to him and to be a good student, to be a good uh, practitioner of the sport. You need to be able to teach from your master or sorry, for, to learn from your master. And like, that's what like um, being humble is like the, the biggest, sometimes the hardest step to take. Yeah. But it's like super important to get yourself to the next level is by listening to people who are better than you, who have yeah. better than you. That's such a loaded term. Oh, I, I, I mean, like I more think, experienced than yeah. you. Like, you know, like be able to listen, take in their advice, you know, and and uh, listen to what they're saying. So what I was what I was trying to say with all that is that when it comes to jujitsu. When I was like competing a lot and trying to win gold medals, I always thought transition, position, then submission. And I think there are a lot of lower belts out there, especially white belts who coming in in the gym with a chip on their shoulder, trying to get that submission before they get anything else. And it's like, bro. And so when Thomas was saying, hey, I remind them we're just training partners here. What I remind them is like, I understand you're trying to get better. I understand you don't know a lot of technique, but here's what you need to focus on while you're learning. Transition, position, then submission. Don't be trying all these submissions. That's how you're going to hurt people. Because you don't freaking know how to transition into a, a dominant position. Like, if you don't know that shit, don't be trying to do these uh, freaking submissions. Like that's what like yeah. that's what frustrates me the most is like you need to learn right. transition and then position i i think the whole not listening thing you know to your coach i think it's a combination of um you know being in the moment you know either in competition or in you know when you're training like not here and that's a problem because it's like if you're so much into your role and focusing on submission and all that stuff and you don't hear your coaching you don't hear other people uh, that's a safety issue. And I think also in my competition, not hearing your coach. Well, sometimes it's like so loud. And other times it's like, you know, some people are very focused on doing this one particular move that they know or this one particular, you know, submission. But they don't see the, from the perspective, they, they don't have an outside perspective because, you know, they just focus on the, whatever is in front of them. So, yeah, I think it's a combination. And then also it's like, you know, sometimes it's ego. But at the end of the day, if it's ego, then why are you even training? It's if you're not going to listen to a coach. Because they walk into the gym thinking, I want to beat someone up. Yeah. There are people who walk in, you know, fresh fish, no experience, that think that for whatever reason, they're, you know, king of the damn hill. And... Usually, if they stick around a lot, there there are listening problems. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've seen, you know, taking a class, no matter who the coach is, no matter who's teaching it, where during rolling, we're trying to give folks advice, and then they just kind of, like, look at us. You know they heard you, and then they continue on with whatever, whatever nonsense that they're they're trying, you know. It's like, hey, do an Oma Plata, like, right now, and they look at you, completely you know brushed off and they do a, a freaking flying yeah. octopus choke or it's something like, it's like it's like who are you to tell me what to do you yeah. know right uh, i right. i know it's better like, who why do they i just that's what i find so frustrating because it's like who are you <laughs> like I mean, who do I, you think I, you are yeah. like i mean at the end of the day out of the gym man yeah. at the end of the day it's a waste of money for them it's like if if you're not gonna listen to you're literally taking something, a sport, and you're not going to listen to your coach. There's no way you're going to advance. There's no way they're going to. You're not. You're never going to get promoted that mm-hmm. way. You're not going to advance. You're not going to learn anything, and you're just going to come to class every week trying to smash everyone, and you're either going to injure people or higher belts are going to smash you, mm-hmm. and you're going to get your feelings hurt. So it's just like you're just wasting money and time. Yeah, for some, for on on some level, with some of the, those guys, it's a respect issue, especially when it comes to not listening to the coach. 
you know, I've seen I've seen directly some of those guys, you know, when Coach A gives them advice about something, they don't listen. But Coach yeah. B, who they obviously <laughs> respect a lot more, gives them advice and then they're doing it. You know, now that that comes down again to a personality issue. But there's also other people who are just naturally respectful to anybody in a in a position of authority and when any of those people tell them to do something they you know they do it without hesitation but I, you know, go ahead i would hope that like gender is not an issue but i i cannot say with confidence that it is that it's not a factor it is it is from, from my <laughs> yeah. own experience unfortunately it is yeah yeah like when i've tried teaching and I feel like I'm not being listened to. And I don't know if it's because I'm um, not like as um, consistently there as like Thomas is, or if it's because I'm a female. And, you know, it's always like, yes, sir. And like, well, I'm a ma'am. So I don't know if that's, <laughs> you know, if it is it because I'm a ma'am that they don't want to like respect me or like, I don't know. Uh. I mean, I've definitely felt that lack of respect from from lower belts and from other like, you know, just students. And I don't know. I You know, it's like I don't know if it's a denial thing, you know, me thinking it's not a gender issue, but, I, you know, deep down, I feel like it might be. Eh, mm-hmm. You know, it, it, if it is, you know what my standard answer would be. I can't say it here because I don't want to get banned off of Twitch. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, there there are people uh, who... I was, just... I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. You, you oh, I, I, have a, I have an answer for that. <laughs> yeah, Wally knows what I'm about to say. But, you know, there's people who are just... They, they don't respect... They, they're just overall not respectful people. You know, mm-hmm. the, the amount of yeah. respect they show to people, you know, basically <laughs> relies on how badly can you kick my butt? And... Yeah. You know, there's some people who just have a perception of, you know, they walk into a room and then they see one black belt, a brown belt, two purple belts, and everybody else. And then they automatically assume, oh, the only two guys that can kick my butt are the brown belt and the black belt. Everybody else I don't have to listen to. Like, ah, oh, you're nothing yeah. to me. And I, I'm i not 100% sure that's the case, but I've seen a, a, a handful of people who gave me that impression. But, you know... Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, how t- how tall are you, Yana? Five, 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 six? Five, six. Yeah. You know, you're, there's some, some of the teenagers, for example, like they're your height and bigger, you mm-hmm. know, they walk in and they see an instructor who's five, six and a lot smaller than them. And, you know, if they're not good people, they're going to think, oh, if it came down to it, I could push, just push you around. Mm. But. You know, you know where that especially does not work, Muay Thai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because all the instructions, a quick knockout, like, boom. All the all the crews are like, you know, they're, they're these, you know, five two, five three, um, Thai instructors. This is where they're... Frankie would come in and like be like, yeah. Yeah. yeah crew John yeah, has entered tra- the chat. <laughs> yeah, who have been training for like decades, and, and they always since they, they were like five happy. years old, not even just decades, a life. Yeah, lifetime. exactly. Yeah, it's like they're always happy and always smiling, but it's you know they will ruin your life, dude. You know, you know what, Crouchon, they will destroy you. I, I'll tell you what, mm-hmm. Crouchon, when uh, I used to see him regularly, was always one of the kindest people I'd ever met. And uh, when I had to start bringing the boys to the gym so I could practice, he would he literally would grab them. And make sure they're okay and carry them around while he was teaching class. And I was oh, like, that's what's yeah. up. He's such a, you know, he spent uh, time as a monk. Did you know that? Like He did? Oh, yeah? Yeah. 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 As an official monk, like, for almost a year or something. I don't remember the, the length of time. But, like, it was some promise he made or something. I don't I don't remember. But, he, yeah, he legit. Man, that sounds like a movie. Month, that sounds which like I was a movie like, plot. when I when I learned it, I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense because he's such a chill yeah. individual, yeah. you know. Well, uh, to to bring my point home, one every every once in a while he would just play around with me and like tap me with kicks, and one <laughs> yeah. time he tapped me a little bit too hard, and I I panicked. I was like, oh god. <laughs> 
Please don't you kick me anymore. You broke my leg. I don't want... <laughs> I, I, I do not want... I, I am not a Muay Thai person. Please. Sorry, sir. Yeah. And for him, and it was I, probably like, oh, I was speaking like a feather. What? Yeah. Yeah, what's wrong, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I was just giving you a I mean, I, I think like at the end of the day, you know, walk into the... Wherever you go, whatever martial art, you need to walk into there with humility and mm-hmm. with a completely open mind and understanding that you're there to learn, not there to destroy people or to prove anything or, you know, and because that's, that's the only way that you're going to get the most out of it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's hard to, like, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. And I, this comes with a lot of... Um, Hindsight, I'll say, because as you and Thomas well know, I used to go really hard back in the day and I was kind of an asshole and it wasn't. And I mean, one one part of it was that's why I can like I can relate to a lot of lower belts and they're just trying to like be in competition mode. They're they're trying to get better and they feel like and they don't know enough technique. So what? There, it's a lot of muscling through things. So it's like, I get that. And where was I going with this? So I know that I, I, I used to be that asshole, you know, who was going a hundred all the time. And cause I was competing a lot and I, I saw every match as a competition match, you know, every match mm. with my teammates as a competition match, which, you know, in hindsight, I realize is not fair. But like that was mentality I was in. I was like, I, I need to go hard all the time or else I'm not going to win in my competition. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know I've definitely felt the brunt of that as well. So while you mentioned like people coming in trying to prove something and I think I was one of those people, but I wasn't trying to like, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know what I would have, I was trying to um, prove. I think, maybe more something to myself than anyone else. And I think a lot of people who walk in with a chip on their shoulder are trying to prove something more to themselves, more than they probably even realize than Mm. they are trying to prove to anyone else. Right. And so when I was in there and I was going hard all the time, I was trying to prove to myself that I was strong enough to overcome any obstacle. Right. Mm. Even if it was like the hardest obstacle of some like, guy who was twice my size and twice my weight, you know, I could still beat him. Right. I, w- mm-hmm. I had this mentality that like, it shouldn't ever matter their size, their weight, their, their experience. I should be able to beat them because I should be able to overcome everything or anything and everything. Right. So go ahead, Thomas. So when you were, when you were in super Yana mode, when you would roll with me, I would just stiff arm you to keep you away. Always, I fucking, <laughs> I fucking hate it. I'm like this guy doing this shit again. Like, what am I supposed to do with this? I just like, oh. Okay. Well, I was, <laughs> I was, I was, I was, uh, I was going to show you the counter to the stiff arm, but then I was like, eh, I'll let her figure it out. It was like, yeah, no, don't, don't, don't let her know. Don't let her know. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I mean, like, I, I, I was saying all that to just illustrate. Like, I understand both sides of the story. Um, where it's like, as a white belt, you don't know, like, you don't know percentage. What does percentage even mean to you going a hundred yeah. versus like 90, you yeah. know, if you have no technique. Yeah. 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 And you know, my, my main thing is it perspective. You know, yeah. Again, just to reiterate, they might see me rolling with one of you two and think that I'm going a hundred percent. Yeah. I'm really not. Mm-hmm. So it, it is, it is hard to, to, it is hard to gauge, you know. You know what I mean. Like, what is my fifty percent compared to Yana's or Wale's? Mm-hmm. What's my fifty percent compared to somebody who doesn't know anything? Yeah. You know what? What does that look like? Then that that's one of the hardest things to convey. You know. Yeah. I always, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, right, it's I, a hard I, thing I, to teach. Yeah, I I think also the willingness to listen. You know, because like we were saying, someone's going for someone's going 100 percent if you sit them down and tell them hey you gotta slow it down you gotta you know learn position and all that other stuff before you try submissions you know if they're willing to listen then 
yeah, that's great. But if they're not, then it's just like, again, why are you even here if you're not going to listen to anyone? Yeah. Uh, you know, why are you even here if you're not going to listen to like, you know, higher belts? Just also, not necessarily just listening to black belts, but listen to people who have had more experience than you. And right, even exactly. like, even like some some white belts, you know, it, they. Uh, doing like training or something, they may mention like, oh, maybe try this to be, and I'm not necessarily going to discount their their opinion because you know there are some techniques that honestly I've forgotten since or haven't used since I was a white belt. So it's it's being able to listen to everyone and being able to take what's important from from what they're telling you and use that. Yeah. Well. Yeah. The interesting thing about uh, the interesting thing about Chan- Chantilly MMA, just a little plug there. Um, you never know who the white belt that comes on the mat is because they could have a very interesting grappling background. So especially yeah. Mongolians, because they're all about that Mongolian wrestling, which is amazing. But, yeah. yeah, it's a. It, I mean that they're beasts. They're monster. I, I still, I still want to try it out on one of the festivals. Say again. I still want to try out Mongolia wrestling at one of the festivals. Oh, I, I want to wear the whole getup too. Yeah. <laughs> no, they. Um, I, they. I'll be like the smallest guy there. Uh. No, probably not. No. 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 I wasn't the smallest guy there, and you're bigger than I am now. Mm. So I mean it's a dip it's a different kind of ball game though. I mean they know pressure really well and, and you know, wrestling. So it's a different kind of game. Well I bef- I, I do want to ask real quick, what are you drinking tonight? Mm-hmm. That was just LaCroix. What? LaCroix. Mm. Oh, 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 oh. I thought what this is booze booze and BJJ. What the heck? I know, it's the it's the closest thing that I had on hand. So I can act like I'm drinking booze. <laughs> That'll make you feel better. <laughs> well, just it would. Go just, ahead, act away. Just don't hey, have. You know a, what I want to tell you about yourself. <laughs> be like, yeah, I'll tell you about yourself. Your mama, and then <laughs> oh. like, Ooh. and then drop, <laughs> and then just just to, like drop off the camera. Um, yeah, just don't drink. Um, or not drink. Just don't ingest a. Jello shot with a high concentration of vodka. If you have gout, it's a very bad idea. <laughs> That's why I'm not drinking anything tonight. Nah. I'll I'll try to avoid that. It's terrible. My foot, it's swollen. Mm. I need to cut it off. Have you been able to? I mean, we're kind of going off topic here, but are you able to walk comfortably on it or no? Yeah, it's not bad. It's more of an annoyance than anything. Mm-hmm. Mm. Luckily, but it, it hasn't it hasn't gotten to the point where it's like ultra painful. I yeah. could probably train on Tuesday if, if if everything continues to you know go well. So well, I'll be there. Wally, when are you coming to Chantilly? I gotta make a trip up there. Um, that did not know. sound enthusiastic That's... at all. No, no, I I, I do want to come. I just like. Especially in the year, my schedule so packed. Um, yeah. Uh, what what days are the class again? That depends on what you want to do, sir. Would you like to do Muay Thai? No gi. Open. Well, uh, let's see. Gi. I don't know Thursday evenings you have gi. I, I feel like Tuesday and Thursdays would be the days you want to be there. Mm. At like seven o'clock, right? Because there's a lot of there's a lot of judo and yeah. jiu-jitsu, whereas like Mondays and Wednesdays and Fridays are all nogi. So, yeah. I mean, I do need to start get, picking here, up all my nogi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, if you want to do nogi, <clears throat> it's Muay Thai and nogi on Mondays and Wednesdays. And then uh, my nogi class is on Fridays at seven. A dojo storm your class. <laughs> Oh, don't worry. I'll have the guys handle you. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at the schedule. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let y'all know. Well, we are kind of coming up on the hour, so I'm going to wrap things up real quick. Final thoughts, Yana? 
Um, final thoughts are if you're new-ish, new or new-ish to jiu-jitsu, um, always keep these things in mind. Listen to the belts who are more experienced than you. Always think transition, position, then submission. And 100% is not always the best method. Well, it. Yeah, I mean, I, was, I, was, I don't know. So, you know, humility and courtesy, you know, when you're training, it's you, you, you got to listen to it to the coaches, higher belts, and people giving you advice. And also being courteous to your training partner, because if you injure all of them, then who, who are you going to train with? <laughs> You're not going to have many people to train with. So, yeah. And have fun. My final thoughts are, <laughs> don't heel hook the white belts. And if you do, <laughs> make sure you knee bar them afterwards. <laughs> Profound wisdom from Thomas. <laughs> wisdom Pretty don't ever do that problems. anyways <laughs> um i'll see y'all later and thank you for the time right. we'll we'll record again next week um All right. cool. yeah we'll talk about wilson who again stood us up yet again <laughs> should join next week and then we're just gonna roast him and talk about like his upcoming match and stuff so okay yeah. i'll see cool. y'all later bye All right. see you. All right. bye bye thomas yeah